Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Mark mentioned, my name is Andrew Bentley, and I'm a principal with Rothstein Cass and the leader of the tax practice in the Boston office. Uh, by now, many of you have heard about our firm. We do audit and tax services for a lot of alternative investment funds, but I just wanted to mention that we've also won a lot of awards for the quality of our service. Most recently, Hedge Fund Review called us the top accounting and auditing firm uh, in the nation, um, and we're very pleased about that. As a tax guy, and since it's early April, I wanted to mention that that has a lot to do with uh, timely delivery of accurate K-1s. And so just a shameless plug, if any of you are out there struggling to get your K-1s in time, slam dunk problem for us to solve. We do it better than anyone. OK. Uh, today, we have a great uh, keynote speaker uh, conducting a fireside chat. will be Lawrence Aragon, uh, Aragon, digital editor of Reuters Deals Group. Mr. Aragon has been a business journalist and editor for more than 20 years. He has covered venture capital and technology startups since the early 90s. Before joining Thomson Reuters, he was a VC editor for Red Herring Mag Magazine. Joining Lawrence will be Peter Barris, who has served as the managing general partner of New Enterprise Associates since 1999. Since that time, NEA's committed capital has grown from $1 billion to over $13 billion, and the firm has expanded its operations globally. Under Peter's leadership, NEA has invested in industry transforming technology companies like Career Builder, Data Domain, Diapers.com, Groupon, Juniper Networks, Macromedia, Salesforce.com, Workday, and TiVo. Mr. Barris has been named several times to the Forbes Midas list. Prior to joining NEA, he had senior leadership positions at Legion Corporation, UCell Corporation, and spent a decade at GE in a variety of manage management positions. Please help me welcome Peter and Lawrence. I'll, uh, I'll go on the uh, left. Okay. Great. Howdy, folks. So Peter was complaining that he felt like a small fry, uh, even though they have uh, 13 billion under management uh, with some of the private equity firms here. But, uh, so venture is definitely smaller, but uh, an incredibly important asset class, although some people don't like to call it an asset class. Um, there's, you know, so I was talking to a gentleman earlier, and he was, he was asking about VC. He's on the, on the buyout side. And he, he mentioned that it, it seemed like uh, more firms were not making money than making money. So, I think there is sort of a general sense that, you know, the VC hasn't sort of rebounded. What's your, what's your overall outlook for, the, for venture over, say, you know, th next three to five years? And is it generally positive or negative? Well, it's, it's actually very positive. And, and uh, despite the lackluster results over the last decade plus, um, which, by the way, you know, the, the interesting thing about the industry is it depends on what window you want to use and who you want to compare the industry to. So if you, if you want to compare the indus industry results to Dow, jo Dow Jones and S&P, if you take a 20-year window, VC looks spectacular. If you took a 15-year window, it looks spectacular. If you take a 10-year window, not so good. Still exceeded the Dow Jones and S&P, not the NASDAQ. If you take a seven-year window, pretty good. A five-year window, very good. One year, not so good. So what's your window? Um, the, and, and, and the thing is about our asset class, which is unlike other asset classes for the most part, um, the, the standard deviation from the median, top quartile, bottom quartile, is pretty wide. So yeah, there are a lot of firms that have lost money. There are a lot of firms that have made money. So. Um, depends on the sample group. But putting all that aside, you know, we had the bubble and the bust, and that's been written about ad nauseum, um, and it's been a tough decade. But the reason I'm excited is it looks like we've worked through um, the overhang that resulted from our past sins. So for the past five years, the industry has invested more than has been committed. 30 billion more than has been committed. So it's, it continues even a decade later to work off that overhang. But there's 199 billion under management. That's down 40% from 10 years ago. 
So I think we're finally at the point where we're getting around $20 billion a year, plus or minus, coming into the industry. That's sustainable. There's, depending on how you want to count it, and definitions are different, but there's at least 50% fewer firms today than a decade ago. And so that feels right to me. So the industry now is poised, and everybody likes to talk about when there's an overhang, um, the fact that, that it's too much money chasing too few deals, and that leads to high valuations, and you can't make money on that. But what's not often talked about is the fact that when you have too much money, it's not just the valuations, it's the fact that a lot of companies get funded in any particular sector. And we are a business of hits. I mean, there's no doubt about it, no matter how you slice it, whether it's at a firm level or at a, at a industry level, a relatively small number of companies represent the vast majority of returns. And when a sector is overfunded, no company can rise above the noise. And so bringing the, the industry back into equilibrium is hugely important, important. Now, on the opportunity side, I've never, I've been in this industry for 20 <coughs> years now. I've never seen an opportunity set and a set of dynamics like exist today. So, um, you know, we can talk, we, we, NEA, invest in a lot of different areas, healthcare, technology, but let me focus on tech for a moment because that's the area I know best. And um, it's been, a lot's been written about what's going on in the consumer space for a couple of two, three years now. Uh, what we're really excited about is what's going on in the enterprise space, which is an outgrowth of that change in consumer. So if you can think, if you think at a very high level, way back when, and now I'm aging myself, uh, I started at GE in the timesharing business. <laughs> and timesharing then at G Information Services was all about taking expensive computing, mainly in the form of mainframes, and sharing it across lots of companies. And then we went through a couple of decades of shifting so that that went to client, server, and PC, and it pushed the computing down to individual companies and ultimately to desktops. Well, we're going back the other way now. We're coming full circle. Uh, and so now there's shared infrastructure. When you talk about the cloud, it's shared infrastructure. And so at that level, we're going through a massive shift. So the shift we went through in PC and client server that created companies like Microsoft and Oracle and SAP and EMC, we're going through a revolution now and we're at the early stages of it that is bigger. It's as dramatic, but it's global and there are a lot more players and a lot more dollars at work. So it's a two and a half trillion dollar industry that's under siege right now. And so you can go down the, the, um, the stack, whether it be at the application level, the operating system level, the database level, storage or networking, and they're all being massively disrupted at a speed and a breadth we've never seen before. So it's exciting. So given the industries now, this is a long-winded answer to your short question, <laughs> but given that the industry's now kind of at an equilibrium, I believe, and we have this opportunity set, and I just described it in the tech enterprise area. We could talk about consumer, we could talk about healthcare, and there's similarly exciting things going on there. It's a, it's a fabulous environment. I, I was gonna ask you, you know, uh, about, you know, there's lots of institutional investors here and why they should get into VC, but I think you just answered that. Um, you know, one of the things I wanted to, to talk to you about was, I mean, you, you take a very different approach than most venture capital firms. Um, much more formal, uh, you know, whereas lots of uh, firms will raise uh, individual funds, you know, with, based on a different geography or sector, what have you, um, you, you keep in everything in, in one fund, and your most recent fund was uh, $2.6 billion. Um, can you talk about, you know, why you take that approach and, and why that has been so successful? Uh, yeah, I think we, we decided as a firm, um, 
oh, mid-90s that this industry, our industry, the venture capital industry was going to go the way of a lot of other industries and a lot of other financial services industries, whether you want to compare it to investment banking or, or commercial banking that bifurcated into bulge bracket and boutique, money center bank and community bank. We thought there were a lot of dynamics at work that s suggested our industry would go in the same direction. It would probably take longer because of the nature of our business, 10 and 12 year partnerships, but it would go un unmistakably in that direction, and it has. And, and I think it, that, that trend accelerated with the, um, uh, w with what happened in 2000 and then with what happened in 2008, it's real clear that the concentration of funds um, uh, accelerated. I mean, even in the last, in last, last year, 10, uh, I think it was 190 or 200 firms raised capital, but 10 of them represented 50% of the capital. Yeah, it was like 182, I was looking yeah. at the numbers, yeah. And then, uh, but five years ago, uh, 10 firms represented 25% of the capital. So that concentration is accelerating. And, and we, and you know, the best way I can explain besides those macro dynamics, if I, again, kind of look at it at a micro level, when I came into this industry 10 years ago, uh, the typical venture capital was almost exclusively U.S. Um, and when a company started, it didn't think internationally. By the time we were ready to exit the company, the dialogue about international expansion was beginning. Now, more often than not, day one, companies are talking global. They might be starting in a foreign market if it's a U.S. company. They might be uh, accessing services or IP. Uh, whatever the case, more often than not, they're thinking globally. So just like investment banks went international to support their clientele that were large multinationals, the GEs of the world, we said we have to support our companies globally. And that's really what uh, got us moving globally. And, and the macro trend about larger funds, we, we do invest in some cap capital intensive industries like biotech and to a lesser extent today energy, but we were doing a lot more energy before semiconductor, et cetera, so that takes a lot of capital. Even companies in the social media space that everybody talks about not being capital intensive, yeah. it's not capital intensive to start them, but it's capital intensive to scale them. So a large fund, a global um, uh, uh, nature diversification and sector and stage diversification were all part of a strategy that said that's how we think we can optimize returns. Why haven't, I mean, is it as simple as when you look around at, at so many venture firms, uh, larger ones, and they, and they s go about setting up a, a, sp a special fund for, for a geography or, you know, the iPhone, what have you, uh, is, it, is it really a matter of, you know, um, does it come down to the, the economics and, and you, they can't get everybody on? on board their economics yeah their the economics. Firm's economics within the firm or is is there a lot of you know infighting that goes on how have you been able to be so successful and uh and you've raised you know was it 14 funds it's like how, how can you do it but so many other firms haven't been able to do that well i don't One know that all the firms are motivated to do that i mean you know firms come together and you, you, it's hard to to, to put a broad brush along this because every case is, is an individual case, but you know, it's, it's a few individuals typically that come together and say they want to form a partnership for whatever set of reasons they've had success in the operating world in a particular sector, whatever the case may be. When, and I credit our founders, our firm was founded by three individuals on both coasts. We grew up on both coasts. It was founded in the seven, late 70s and it was their objective to say, one, we're not putting our names on the firm because we want this, in their term, terminology, to be a 100-year firm. Okay. So they started out thinking about this not as a partnership that spanned their lifetimes, but as a partnership that lived on for generations. And so everything they did in terms of establishing the firm was for that, um, that goal. It was toward that goal. And so you know, from the get-go, we were set up that way. So we've put incentive systems in place. 
Um, our partnership, our agreement with our LP differs from most firms. All of it in terms of how we operate from a governance standpoint, from a personnel <coughs> hiring and development standpoint, is, is more institutionalized in that sense. And a lot of our, pe our, our, our folks, myself included, came out of companies, in my, in my case GE, that taught us how to do that. And so it was very natural for us to do that. You had mentioned earlier that, that you had a <coughs> conference call with, the, with your board of advisors um, just today. And we'd spoken about this on the phone. And Half I, hour ago. <laughs> yeah, oh, there you go. Um, and I thought that was really intriguing. And I don't know that, that most VCs, I mean, you have basically a very active board of advisors. Um, and right. uh, can you talk about you know, why that is? I think you, you said you, you meet in person three, three times a year? Three times a year, and then we have quarterly, quarterly. conference calls. So how does that work, and, and what do you get out of it? <clears throat> well, what we get out of it is we have on our board, you know, we try to get represent. We mimic our companies, okay? So if you take a typical venture board, it's made up of the largest stakeholders, which are typically venture capitalists, and some independents, as well as the management team. Our board is made up of many of our largest stakeholders, RLPs, some independents, and we operate it like we operate our boards, which means in the fall of every year, we put a budget in place and we bring it to our board. And we say, here, in, tra in, in, in the interest of transparency, here's where your fee goes. This is how much goes to salaries, compensation. This is how much goes to travel, to facilities, et cetera. These are our hiring plans. These are our compensation plans. They tell us, they, they're not aware of other firms that do that. <laughs> okay, so we've always operated that way and we continue to operate that way. So it's a very different relationship and it gets back to that founding and the, even when the firm was a lot smaller than it is today, it still had the mentality of, we're institutionalizing this practice. It, 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 I mean, even to this day, it, it feels like the venture industry is very much a, a black box. Uh, and I think NEA has taken the approach that you, I mean, you're not completely transparent, but I mean, you've really made an effort to be as transparent as possible with your LPs. Um, it, it just seems to me that uh, that's just a great way to operate. And I, I don't understand why. Well, I'm, I'm sure I understand why they don't do it, <laughs> but do you, do you think that you'll, you will see a change over time, that, that more firms will start to be more transparent? Uh, well, I think there's been some movement uh, toward that over the years, and I'm, I'm, I, don't, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to be the one that uh, passes judgment on my colleagues. <laughs> um, uh, I can only talk about why we're motivated to do what we do. Um, and the benefit that, that's accrued uh, to us is a lot of uh, trust between us and our LPs. And we get a lot in return, by the way. You know, you're in the, when we have a board of advisors meeting, we talk about our strategy, we talk about what's going on in the industry, and a, most of the people that sit on our board have a great vantage point, a great lens into the industry and other firms. They're not sharing proprietary information, but we get terrific insights from them. And that's helpful to us. So we think the value of that transparency is two way, not one way, and we benefit as well. And so that's why we do it. And I, I really can't speak to why other people don't if they, if they don't. Um, you know, for, for, the, uh, for the LPs in the audience, um, what, what do you think are the kind of the key qualities that, uh, that they should look for when they're uh, vetting uh, a venture fund, whether it's you know, a, a first time fund or even a more mature fund? And then conversely, what are some of the, the red flags that, that, that they should look out for? Well, I think, the, I think the qualities are different, whether it's a first time fund or a, a fund that's been around for a while. But clearly for a fund that's been around for a while, you know, performance is number one. I mean, you've got to look for it, and I think consistency in performance. And an organization that you believe, for whatever set of reasons, is going to be around for a long time and, are, and have alignment of interests with the LP. So uh, again, that gets back to 
you know, we, we our, our terms, besides the government features that I talked about, our terms are, are a little unusual too in that we have unusually low fees and we're at the high end of the carried interest yeah. spectrum and, you pay, and we pay back our fees. So essentially they're a loan to us and our attitude is and our selling point to our limited partners is we don't win big financially unless you win big. And yes, it's higher carry than some other firms, but we're not going to we're not going to make it on, on current compensation. So that's alignment of interest. There's a lot of other ways to gauge alignment of interest, but you know that has got to be that's a, a critical part of it. How people are managed, how carry is distributed amongst partnerships. You know, we we uh, we like to think that we're um, uh, you know we're a little unusual too in that we pay our our general partners all the same. Um, regardless of their performance, and y y that's flat. you could debate. It's a yeah. flat compensation system. Whether you're a founder of the firm or you've been a general partner for 10 years, you're getting paid the same way. But what that does is it creates a team environment. We're all feeding off the same trough, if I could sure. use that term. So I care personally, not because not I'm managing partners, so I care regardless. But if I'm another GP in the firm, I care about someone else's deals as much as I care about my own, therefore I'm going to help my partners in the firm. I'm not a lone wolf do with my own practice, if you will. And that, that, in fact, I think is very helpful to our portfolio companies. And if when we talk to portfolio companies about um, partnering with us, they do due diligence on us and they come back and say that's what we hear time and time again is that the company benefited from your other portfolios and that I'm not just getting you, Peter Barris, I'm getting all of your partners as contributors to this. So I think from an LP perspective, they got to look at what is that relationship, how do they operate and work with entrepreneurs, do you have alignment of interests, and you know, how do you manage your personnel so that you're, you're incenting you, you've got the right compensation systems to not only attract, but more importantly, retain the people that are there. Because these partnerships are long partnerships. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, the, the folks in the firm aren't indentured servants, but the LP has to live with those partnerships for a long time. So. Yeah, I mean, there have been a, a few, well, famous in our industry, because it's a small industry, where firms imploded. I mean, what, are, what are some, uh, because of partner differences, uh, what about red flags? I mean, that that could give some indication that that the story that the GP is telling isn't you know as rosy as. as well, I mean, red flags are every VC says the top that, quartile. that they're well, they're top quartile. <laughs> every every VC says they're top quartile. That's a that's a given. Um, they also say they add value to their companies. Yeah. That the difference between VCs and other asset classes are we're in there working and helping our companies. Well, are they? <laughs> and it's easy to check out by talking to the companies and understanding what those differences are between them and other VCs that are on their boards or other VCs that are investors. And I think if they're not in there helping, that's obviously a red flag because that's what venture capital is about. It's not just applying the dollars, it's taking the experience and the pattern recognition that we as partners have built up over a lot of years and applying it to these companies. I can't tell you, there are success stories in our portfolio where I'd say, you know, we added 2% value and there are success stories where we added enormous value and it wouldn't have been a success without our partnership. And we as a partnership wouldn't have the returns we do if our part, if there weren't a lot of those stories. And so a red flag is if the partner's out playing golf and not doing that. <laughs> if they're sitting on too many boards and not adding value. Uh, a lot of those red flags. Uh, obviously, dynamics between partners is critical. And that's a harder thing to ascertain. Um, you know, just asking the question won't get the answer. So how you get at the answer to that question is not, is not a science. But 
getting to that answer is hugely important. Talking to other VCs, how they work on boards, et cetera. I can't tell you how many companies have been spoiled because of board dynamics. So how VCs behave, this is what I tell entrepreneurs to do, and I think it would apply to LPs. We do due diligence on you. You need to do due diligence on us and the other firms you're talking to. And don't just go to our success stories sure. where everybody sat around the table and it was kumbaya. Go to the ones that struggled mightily for a while and then emerged. And that's where you'll really learn about how different VCs act and apply and add value or don't add value. Because that's, that's, the, that's the acid test. And go to those entrepreneurs and ask them what that VC, that partnership, that firm did in those difficult times. I cannot, well, I don't have my glasses on for one thing, but uh, I would like to open this up for questions from the audience. If, is there somebody with a microphone? That, any hands? I've got my glasses on now. Do you see anybody? Don't be shy. Got, I got a question from way back there. Is there a microphone? Peter, thank you for the opportunity to ask you a question. I, uh, I'm with Thomson Reuters, and I, I'm on a panel following this presentation about terms and conditions in LPVC negotiations. If I'm not mistaken, you've um, been very active as uh, around fees and tying them to your operati operating budget. And I'm curious whether you see a general trend in the venture business to rely more on operating um, costs to set management fees? Thanks. Well, I don't, I don't think there's, I, I think when you're a, an early firm, there's a direct <coughs> correlation between operating costs and your fees because oftentimes the fees don't even cover your operating costs. Uh, after you've been in the business for multiple funds, I think there's a disconnect between the two. And I, I think it's been, uh, fee structures have been driven by historical practice more than anything. I don't think people really, firms for the most part, look at tying the two together, if you will. It's another form of compensation, and, and um, you know, the industry has always supported 2% to 2.5% fees. Uh, those are pretty standard, and um, that's the practice, and I don't think anybody really is focused on changing that for the most part. So I don't think it's going to change uh, in all likelihood. Um, uh, and it's not necessarily unfair because a lot of times it does take all of a 2% fee to run the firm. And as firms become global, the, the cost of operating, quite frankly, is more expensive. It does cost us more. Uh, and until you get to scale, um, it's uh, hugely more expensive uh, to operate in places like China and India than it is in the U.S. So those, those fees have to cover those expenses. So again, it comes down to an individual firm situation and whether they're justified or not. But, um, you know, we'll, I, I think the, the dynamic will, is getting affected and will also be affected going forward depending on, on you know, what happens from a, a tax and regulatory standpoint. So, you know, the, the, obviously the famous discussion about carried interest taxation. Um, I can, I can tell you were one, one of the things besides alignment with LPs um, that plays into how we're structured is the fact that carried interest is, is in fact taxed as capital gains. Sure. To the extent it's not taxed as capital gains, it does change the dynamic. That sounds foreboding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> any, uh, any other questions? Is it gentleman right here. Can we get a microphone over here, please? Okay. Hi. Uh, th thank, thank you, Peter, for, uh, for, for this. Um, uh, you, you mentioned in the abstract a discussion about, uh, about board dynamics and about um, uh, uh, the, the risks of board dynamics blowing up uh, uh, firms. 
Can you provide some more concrete guidance as to what sorts of red flags you would look for and, and how you would be able to determine them? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's a difficult question to answer. I think the, um, you know, we do 360 reviews with our general partners and partners, and part of that 360 review is not only talking to people within our own firm, but talking to other VCs and talking to other entrepreneurs. And, and so it's important to us that, um, um, you know, if, an, if a CEO says things about an individual within the firm or doesn't say things, oftentimes it's what's not said rather than what is said. And what you want to hear is the obvious. That person rolled up their sleeves and they helped us in critical ways and here's what they are. If you don't hear that, it suggests there's an issue. It suggests that person is uh, either very passive or not terribly competent, quite frankly, and so that's a red flag. Uh, can I be more specific than that? No, because it, it is case specific, and it depends on the situation the company's in and what they're going through. But you want to ferret out whether also what the dynamic is between that individual and the other VCs. Because if they're not goal aligned, you, you know, you can, you, you would hope that the VCs and management are goal aligned, but invariably there are times when they're not. The problems exist when the VCs aren't even aligned. Because then the company can't set its priorities, whether they be strategic or operational, because they've got a divided board, if you will. And that's when companies tend to flounder. And that's when, and that, that obviously is exacerbated in a situation where a company's troubled because that's where it's even more important than otherwise for those priorities to be crystal clear. And if everybody's not, excuse the cliche, rowing in the same direction, you got a problem. And so what is that dynamic? Does the individual pound their fist and berate management or do they roll up their sleeves and help them? when times are tough. I wish we could keep going. This has been fascinating. Uh, please uh, join me in thanking uh, Peter for uh, spending the time with us today.